Okay, let's talk about cells. This is a cell. This is a eukaryotic cell. We're going to talk about the differences between eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells just on a very basic level. And we're going to spend most of the time on the eukaryotic cell. It's very important for you to understand eukaryotic cell structure in this course. So this is a basic eukaryotic cell. I know when I was in elementary school, the way cells were described to me, actually probably in junior high and high school too, until I really started looking at cells under the microscope, I always pictured them being this gelatinous blob with things kind of free floating through the cell. And of course now we know that's not the case. You can see the cytoskeleton running throughout the cell, giving it its structure. Things are going to move along this network of fibers rather than just free floating. So the cell is far more complex than I ever thought it was when I was first in school. This is, oops. This is just a chart of cell size, just kind of showing you things relative to each other. I don't really expect you to in any way memorize these cell sizes. I just kind of want to give you a picture of relative cell sizes. So, kind of silly, they have a whole human up there. <laughs> I don't know why. But you can see a chicken egg, and then frog eggs, and then going down to cells. So, the basic plant or animal cell is about 100 micrometers in, in length. And a micrometer is 10 to the minus 6, so that's six zeros in front of that one after the decimal. So that's one one millionth of a meter. That's pretty small. It would take one million of those to equal a meter. And then smaller than that are bacterial cells, prokaryotic cells. Smaller than that are going to be some of the organelles we're going to look at today. And then somewhere in there, in, in between the size of bacteria and, and the various organelles we're going to look at, which are the cell parts, you have viruses. Viruses are very, very small. They would have nine zeros before the one. It's 10 to the minus 9 meters. A nanometer is the approximate size of a virus. So again, not important to memorize those numbers. Just kind of giving you relative sizes of cells. This is a prokaryotic cell. So what do I mean by prokaryote versus eukaryote? So prokaryote and eukaryote. These are two very important terms to know in biology. Pro means before, and eu, EU means true. So this is before, and this means true. What does karyote mean? Karyote means kernel. In this point, in this context, it's referring to the nucleus. So this means before nucleus, and this means true nucleus. So you can already guess the major difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes is that eukaryotic cells have a nucleus, prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus. And this includes archaea and bacteria. We're going to mostly talk about bacteria in this course. And we're just going to talk about them a little bit. You go on to take microbiology, you will spend a whole semester talking about bacteria, but I'm just going to give some comparisons real general terms between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells today. We're mostly going to focus on eukaryotic cells. So eukaryotes, true nucleus. This includes plants, animals, fungi, and protists. Protists are single-celled organisms that can be animal-like, plant-like, or kind of a combination of the two. They're all single-celled. So eukaryotes obviously much more diverse, and most of these are multicellular, except for the protists. The protists are the single-celled eukaryotes. And all the plants, animals, and fungi, for the most part, are multicellular. Whereas all prokaryotes are single-celled, meaning the whole organism is one cell. It's kind of like living in a studio apartment where everything happens in that one room. So you're cooking, you're cleaning, you're sleeping, you're showering, everything's happening in that one room. That's what happens in a single-celled organism. So prokaryote, before nucleus, that means they don't have a nucleus in their cell, and you can see that in this very basic structure on the board. The DNA is just free in the cell. This is a rod-shaped bacterial cell, 
And that's typically how we'll draw an example of a bacterial cell on the board, just because it's easier to draw. Okay, so this is going to be basic prokaryotic cell structure. There's going to be a plasma membrane surrounding the cell. And you can see that here, plasma membrane. Okay, and then outside that plasma membrane is a cell wall. You're going to see the plants have a cell wall too, but the plant cell wall is made of cellulose. We already talked about cellulose when we talked about structural polysaccharides in the carbohydrate unit. Remember, cellulose is just a chain of glucose. This bacterial cell wall, though, is not made of cellulose. It's made of something called peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan. What is peptide referring to? Anytime you see the word peptide, what type of macromolecule is that referring to? That's right, it's referring to protein. And then the glycan, glycogen, that's referring to carbohydrate. So this cell wall isn't just all carbohydrate, like cellulose is in, in a plant cell. It's actually made of something called peptidoglycan. Then we have the DNA all curled up in the cell. And that DNA is not protected from the cytoplasm of the cell. It is just free in the cell. So this is the bacterial DNA. No nuclear envelope. So not enclosed in a membrane. It's not protected from the cytoplasm of the cell. So no nuclear envelope. Hence, no nucleus. And that's again what prokaryote means for nucleus. Then we have ribosomes out here where proteins are going to get translated. And that's really the only organelle per se that prokaryotic cells have. They're very simple in structure. Their whole goal is to reproduce quickly, keep it simple, and reproduce very quickly. They use ribosomes to make new proteins and ultimately make new bacterial cells. Some bacteria are more complex or surrounded by a capsule, but we're not going to concern ourselves with that. When we talk about bacteria, we'll get into more details about ways they can move and, and structures they use to adhere to surfaces. We'll get into that more when we talk about bacterial cells in more detail later in the course. But for now, I just want you to know the basic differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells do not have any membrane-bound organelles. Okay, so no membrane-bound organelles. They just have ribosomes, and that DNA is just free in the cytoplasm, subjected to the chemistry of the cell, is not protected in a nuclear envelope. Eukaryotic cells, on the other hand, are much more complex. They do have membrane-bound organelles. The DNA is going to be protected in a nuclear envelope. And that's what we're going to spend our time talking about for the rest of this lecture. This is the plasma membrane. And we're going to talk about the plasma membrane as a separate lecture after cell structure. So just realize that when I draw a cell on the board and I talk about the plasma membrane, it's a phospholipid bilayer. And we've already talked about this in some detail, where the phospholipid has a polar or water-loving head, in other words, a hydrophilic head, and then these hydrophobic tails that point inward away from water. So we have water outside the cell, water inside the cell, and those phospholipids are going to form a bilayer. We're going to talk about that whole membrane system as a separate lecture. This lecture is going to focus more on the internal structure of a eukaryotic cell. So we're mostly going to focus on animal cells. I will talk a little bit about plant cells. But we're mostly going to focus on eukaryotes, primarily animals. Okay, so let's draw a cell. So this is a eukaryotic cell, and this is going to be an animal. 
an animal cell. Okay, so surrounding the cell is this phospholipid bilayer, the plasma membrane. Okay, and then let's look at more detail of the cell. Okay, so we have the plasma membrane surrounding the cell. And really, the, this picture is showing you a cell isn't flat. A, felt, a cell is, has three dimensions. It's not just flat like we draw it on the board. We have this nuclear envelope protecting the DNA. So another phospholipid bilayer, another membrane. In fact, it's a double phospholipid bilayer. And this is called the nuclear envelope. This is what really defines the nucleus of the cell. And inside here, we have the DNA. Protected from the cytoplasm. So eukaryote, true nucleus. Eukaryotic cells have a nucleus. This nuclear envelope has little openings in it, so the materials can move in and out of the nucleus, and those openings are called nuclear pores. So nuclear pores are going to allow materials to move in and out of the nucleus. Let's look at what those look like. Okay, so these are the little nuclear pores, and you can see them covering the whole nucleus. And then we're going to start having some more complex organelles throughout the cell. As I go through these organelles, it's important to note, you can tell a lot about a cell's main job based on how many of certain organelles it has. If a cell is packed full of certain organelles, you can tell really what that cell's job is. So as we go through these organelles and talk about their functions, I'm going to give you some examples of cells that would be really packed full of those particular types of organelles. So we have something in eukaryotic cells called the endomembrane system. This is going to be a lot of membranes that all really communicate with each other and connect with each other to produce products in the cell and move products around in the cell. Some of those products will eventually move out of the cell. So part of that endomembrane system is really what we've already listed, the nuclear envelope. And on, then finally on the outside, the plasma membrane. But there are going to be some other really important membrane out organelles as well. And let's start with the endoplasmic reticulum, the ER. Connected to nuclear pores, we're going to have, again, a phospholipid bilayer, this system of flattened membranous sacs called the endoplasmic reticulum. ER for short. And there are going to be two types of endoplasmic reticulum, rough ER and smooth ER, or rough endoplasmic reticulum and smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And these two have very different functions. Let's start by talking about rough ER. And in order to understand the job of rough ER, we need to understand a little bit more about ribosomes, because the two are going to be connected. So we have really two categories of ribosome in the cell. Remember, ribosomes we've already talked about in a previous lecture on proteins. Ribosomes are going to be the site of protein translation. So remember, we're going to make a copy of our DNA called messenger RNA. That messenger RNA is going to come out through a nuclear pore into the cytoplasm, and a ribosomal complex is going to start reading that messenger RNA 
and assembling those amino acids to make a polypeptide chain, and ultimately our three-dimensional protein. Well, that happens on ribosomes, and ribosomes in the cell can either be free out here in the cytoplasm, we'll call those free ribosomes, and we can also have ribosomes that are associated with the rough ER. In fact, they're attached to the outside of the rough ER. And those are going to be called bound or attached ribosomes. Okay, so also called attached. They are bound to the rough ER. This is a pretty handy arrangement because what is going to happen is when we need to make a protein that stays in the cell, we're going to do it out here on these free ribosomes. But if we need to package a protein for export, this is really handy because what's going to happen is a piece of this membrane can pinch off with that protein product and move that product around through the cell and even eventually out of the cell. So this is a really handy setup. On the rough ER, we're going to have protein assembly on the bound ribosomes. And again, what's so cool about this is as we make that protein product, it can feed into the lumen of this rough ER and then a piece of that can pinch off carrying that protein product to carry it somewhere else. So this is a really handy setup. And again, protein assembly on the bound ribosomes, and these are primarily proteins for export. We have already looked at a couple of proteins that get exported from cells insulin and glucagon. Remember those are both protein hormones. They get secreted by the pancreas to con control your blood glucose levels. So this is a really handy setup to have ribosomes attached to a membrane and now we can package that product and move it through the cell and eventually out of the cell. Again the free ribosomes, these are going to be involved in protein assembly also of course but these are going to be proteins that remain in the cell. So proteins that remain in the cell are going to be assembled on the free ribosomes. So that would be a lot of enzymes that are going to carry out chemical reactions in the cell. It might be some structural proteins in the cell. It might be some, some other categories of proteins that we've looked at in that whole list of different types of proteins. So ribosomes on the ER, which are called bound or free in the cytoplasm. So that rough ER is really involved in packaging those proteins. This membrane, when it breaks off, is called a transport vesicle. It's getting a little messy here. Transport vesicle. That transport vesicle is really just a piece of membrane so it's a phospholipid bilayer, just like all the membranes are. But now it's carrying a product of some sort. And you're going to see that a couple of times in this lecture. Okay, I'm just going to quickly erase a couple of the details on here so I have room to draw some additional structures and continue our list of the endomembrane system. Okay, so we have our free ribosome. So the endomembrane system is going to include the rough ER. It's going to also include the smooth ER, which we haven't talked about yet. The smooth ER is going to have some very important functions that are different from the functions of the rough ER. So smooth ER, and it's also going to include those transport vesicles, that piece of membrane that pinches off. That piece of membrane pinches off from the rough ER, and you're going to see it also pinches off from the smooth ER, and it's also going to pinch off from a, a structure we're going to look at in a few minutes called the Golgi. 
So smooth the art transport vesicles. And we'll continue this list in a couple of minutes. I'm going to actually erase free ribosomes too for now. Okay, so this ER over here that doesn't have ribosomes on it, this is called the smooth ER. And not only does smooth ER not have ribosomes, it actually has some very different enzymes embedded because it's going to have some very different functions than the rough ER. The smooth ER is involved in some very important processes in the body. One thing it's involved in is lipid synthesis. And that would include phospholipids that we've already talked about. And it would also include the lipid-based hormones. What were the lipid-based hormones we talked about? They, they start as cholesterol. They're, they're built from cholesterol. It was estrogen and testosterone. So lipid synthesis including estrogen, and testosterone. So where might you find cells packed full of smooth ER? If this is one of the functions of smooth ER, what kind of cells do you think would be packed full of smooth ER? It would be the cells in the testes and the ovaries that make testosterone and, and estrogen. So estrogen, that's going to be made in the ovaries. And testosterone is going to be made in the testes. So those cells would be packed full of smooth ER. Again, I said you can tell a lot about the job of a cell based on the percentage of certain organelles that are contained in that cell. So that's one important function of smooth ER. Smooth ER has a lot of important functions. We're only going to talk about a few of them. Another important function of smooth ER is it is involved in detoxification. So detoxification of drugs, alcohol, environmental toxins, toxins you encounter in your food, in your water, in the air. Detoxification is the job of smooth ER. So where would we find other cells packed full of smooth ER that are involved in detoxification? What organ in your body is involved in detoxification of drugs and alcohol? It's your liver. So liver cells might be packed full of smooth ER if you're taking a certain medication, legally or illegally, or if you drink a lot, you might have liver cells that are packed full of smooth ER. In fact, we develop something called drug tolerance. And, and you all know this, if, if you start drinking at age 21, or sooner, <laughs> But if you start drinking alcohol, you know that over time, it takes more and more and more alcohol to get the same effect. You don't feel drunk after one beer anymore. Same thing goes for even if you're taking something like allergy medication. Over time, you develop drug tolerance. And that is due to smooth ER. Because those cells are going to produce more smooth ER and they're going to be packed full of it, and your cells are going to get really, really good at detoxifying, and so over time you develop what's called drug tolerance. If you, if you stop taking that drug, that medication, if you stop drinking, over time the cell is going to recycle some of that smooth ER and use those parts to build something else. So over time your drug tolerance will go back down again. But that's one of the important jobs of smooth ER. One more that I'll give you, again there are several others we're not going to talk about in this course, but one, one thing that's important to understand, especially if you're going to take physiology, you're going to talk about muscle contraction. And in part, an important part of muscle contraction is storage and release of calcium ions. So storage and release of calcium ions is the job of the smooth ER. In fact, it's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum when it's in muscle cells, but you don't need to know that level of detail right now. But that's the smooth ER that's in those cells that's involved in the storage and release of calcium that ultimately leads to muscle contraction. So again, smooth ER, rough ER, 
both involved in the endomembrane system. You can make a product in the smoothie yard and have that pinch off into a transport vesicle as well. So that can pinch off and carry that product. So that could be estrogen. Doesn't do you any good if that estrogen stays in the cell. That estrogen needs to get out of the cell. So if we package it in this little transport vesicle, it's going to be able to leave the cell. And you'll see in a while how that happens. So that is also a transport vesicle, part of the endomembrane system. Okay, the next membrane-bound organelle is something called the Golgi. Sometimes it's called the Golgi complex, Golgi apparatus, Golgi body. We're just going to call it the Golgi, G-O-L-G-I. And that Golgi is really just a stack of membranes. It actually has a receiving side and a shipping side. And this is where protein products in particular end up going to the Golgi to get processed further and really labeled for where they are to go. Where in the body, where in the cell, what type of cell, these products are going to get labeled. So this is the Golgi. And it processes, modifies, labels products, in particular proteins. It's going to get those ready for export. Gets products ready for export. It's really the UPS center of the cell. And again, it's going to be a receiving side and a shipping side, and that product moves through the various stacks of the Golgi, part of the endomembrane system. And then ultimately, a piece of that Golgi pinches off, carrying that modified product, whatever that product might be, and that is called a transport vesicle as well. So anytime a piece of membrane breaks off carrying a product, it's called a transport vesicle. Okay, another membrane-bound organelle that's very important. It has some really important functions. And that is a little sac, membrane-bound sac, of hydrolytic enzymes called a lysosome. Not much detail to draw for a lysosome. And it's really just a whole membrane-bound sac with digestive enzymes. So lysosome, it's a sac of hydrolytic enzymes. What reaction do hydrolytic enzymes help carry out? Hydrolysis. Remember when I talked about hydrolysis, I said there are going to be different uses of that term. Hydrolytic is going to be the adjective that describes the enzymes that carry out hydrolysis. Taking a larger molecule and breaking it down into smaller pieces. These lysosomes have a few important functions related to that. So lysosomes are a sac of hydrolytic enzymes. They are involved in recycling cell parts. So cell parts have a lifespan. Those organelles have a lifespan. And over time, we need to recycle those. We can't just make all new parts. We need to break them down and use their parts to build new structures. So the lysosome will bring in one of those old organelles break it down and the, the remaining parts get released. Also cell eating. So if you're a single cell eukaryote, you're going to bring in materials and you're going to actually digest it with your lysosomes. But this is also an important thing for our white blood cells. So in humans this would be white blood cells. We have certain white blood cells that engulf anything foreign and break it down with their lysosomes. Okay, and then digesting entire cells. When a cell dies, or that cell needs to be taken out of the cell cycle, we can open up all of our lysosomes and digest an entire cell. And that's a very important function as well. So lysosomes are a sac of hydrolytic enzymes. 
and they are part of the endomembrane system. So continuing our list of the endomembrane system lysosomes. So before we move on to any other organelles, let's review those other parts. So here you see ER connected to the nuclear pores, which ultimately connects it to the nucleus of the cell. Here you see free ribosomes. So those are going to be involved in protein translation for those proteins that stay in the cell. And then we have bound ribosomes that are on the rough ER. By the way, free ribosomes become bound. A signal goes to attach. This is going to be a protein for export. And then that protein starts feeding into the, the lumen of the rough ER. Here's a bigger picture of a ribosome. And then this would be smooth ER. You can see, in some cases, connected to the rough ER. This is the smooth ER. It's more flattened when you look at it histologically. Oops, sorry. And then this is the Golgi. Again, just this stack of membranes. And you can see these vesicles pinch off carrying the product. Transport vesicles. Again, all part of what we call the endomembrane system. And then finally, here's a lysosome. This is a fantastic picture of a lysosome. It's engulfed a mitochondrion and a peroxisome, which we haven't talked about those two organelles yet. And it's digesting, and it's going to recycle those cell parts. This would actually be an organism that's eating that way, using the lysosomes with the hydrolytic enzymes to break down those materials. So this is the endomembrane system kind of all together. So nuclear envelope connected to the ER, transport vesicles that break off from rough and smooth ER, and also the Golgi. And then ultimately, those transport vesicles can fuse with the plasma membrane. Membrane fuses with membrane. So this transport vesicle can fuse with the plasma membrane, and now those products are released from the cell. That's called exocytosis. And we're going to talk about how things enter and leave the cell when we talk about the plasma membrane. So you'll, you'll see this term in more detail, but it's called exocytosis. This is materials wrapped in membrane leaving the cell. So this is a really handy setup. Okay, so that's the endomembrane system. We have a, a couple of other important parts of the cell that are important to understand that are not part of the endomembrane system. And we'll talk about those next.